Well, thank you, Alan. It's great to be here. Hey, guys, how many of you are zero fives? Good, you guys are taking over. How many five twos? How many of you don't know which one? <laughs> okay, good. So next 15 minutes, I'm going to um, tell you everything you need to know about traumatic aortic injury, both, you know, for the tests and for your life, okay? So um, let's see. First of all, a couple of words about epidemiology. This is the second most common cause of death after blunt trauma. Uh, number one is head injury. And the majority are related to motor vehicle collisions. And the mechanism has to do with rapid deceleration. This is Hunter when he bought his Ferrari. <laughs> but luckily, he did well. Um, these are the motor vehicle deaths in 2010. You can see that there were 37,000 deaths reported. Out of that, uh, about a third are related to traumatic aortic injury. So you can see that uh, this is a significant health problem. If you compare that to aneurysms and dissections in the same year, there were 10,400. So it's almost uh, larger than, than the number of people dying from uh, aneurysm and dissection. I spoke to you about the mechanism. It has to do with deceleration. Uh, the greatest point of strain is at the aortic isthmus. That's where the relatively mobile arch comes into the contact with a relatively fixed descending thoracic aorta, and that's where the transection occurs. Keep in mind they're not all transections, so we call them traumatic aortic injury. That's a more correct term. The diagnosis is based on mechanism, so history and physical is very important if the patient can talk. Chest x-ray uh, is uh, the initial diagnostic test, but the gold standard is the CT angiogram. Uh, for patients who have Equivocal CAT scans, uh, the best test is an intravascular ultrasound or an angiogram. And uh, these are examples of uh, CT scans. This is a uh, isthmus tear. You can see it's a grade three traumatic aortic injury. This is a diagnostic angiogram. This is mainly reserved for uh, you know the therapeutic time. You don't really do this for diagnosis anymore. But when I was a resident, um, this was the diagnostic test. We used to send people for angiogram. Intravascular ultrasound is great. Uh, how many of you have experience with that? Good. So all you know about this. So no contrast, no radiation. You get real-time measurements. You can get morphological uh, clues, plaque, thrombus. And you can see the injury, as you can see in this image right here, uh, large pseudoaneurysm. Uh, we actually did a study where we compared intravascular ultrasound to angiogram in patients who had minor aortic injury. So if the you know, CAT scan comes back, the radiologist says, cannot rule out aortic injury, we took those patients and we did an angiogram and an IVUS on all of them. And IVUS was more sensitive for patients who have minor aortic injuries compared to angiogram because a lot of times you can't see minor tears on an angiogram. There are three false positives you guys need to know about because you're going to get called to the emergency room and you're going to make a decision right there. Does this patient need to have a repair or is this just a false positive? So number one is the aortic spindle. It's just a fusiform aortic isthmus and that's a normal variant. Some people just have that dilatation in that area. So that's not necessarily an aortic injury, okay? Aortic spindle. Number two is the ductus diverticulum. It's a remnant of... Uh, uh, ductus arteriosus, and some patients have a very smooth, you know, diverticulum at that location. It's at the same location that you see the tear. The difference is, how do you, how do you know it's not an aortic injury? Two reasons. Number one, there's no periaortic hematoma, and number two, they don't have the mechanism, you know. So people have done T-bar for this, for this div ductus diverticulum in the past, so you wouldn't be the first one who didn't miss it who missed it. Now the third false positive is the bronchial intercostal artery. That can cause a washout on contrast in this location. Uh, it's it's a, you know, an, another uh, anatomical variant, but just be aware of it. So those three things. Uh, I work at a level three trauma center, level one trauma center. We see a lot of um, you know, grade three injuries, uh, these uh, massive traumas. Uh, 60,000 ER visits, over 18,000 trauma visits, <coughs> over 6,000 trauma admissions, and we have these helicopters that fly patients in. So we see a lot of patients with traumatic aortic injury. And we wrote our initial experience. Uh, this was in 2009. Uh, and um, at that point, we were just starting to um, uh, use modern imaging, such as intravascular ultrasound, and we recognized that traumatic aortic injury was really a spectrum. It, was, it ranges from intimal tear to, you know, uh, uh, rupture. And uh, we did a study on that, and we were seeing these injuries that hadn't been seen before. You know, if you look at the um, 
American Association for the Surgery of Trauma grading system, back then what they said is that descending thoracic aortic injury was a grade four. There was no uh, range or spectrum of injury. So we proposed a classification that was based on the layers of the aorta, intima media and adventitia, and this is what we proposed. Intimal tears are considered grade one, intramural hematomas are considered grade two, pseudoaneurysms grade three, and ruptures grade four. Uh, we recommended medical therapy for grade one injuries uh, and TVAR for grade two, three, four. Um, Grade two injuries can easily be seen on both CAT scan and intravascular ultrasound. There is an external contour abnormality. I want you guys to recognize this. The, the difference between a grade one and a grade two is that a grade two always has an external aortic contour abnormality. You know, grade one is a perfect circle. You have some intimal tear, but a grade two, you see something on the outside of the aorta. Okay, uh, that's how you know the difference. Grade three is very obvious uh, on uh, on Im all imaging modalities, and then grade four is obviously is a free rupture, and you don't have time to do intravascular ultrasound. So we do intra we do medical therapy for grade one and TVAR uh, for all grade two through four injuries. For patients who are not anatomically suitable candidates for TVAR, we will offer an open repair. And this is very straightforward. Um, the same thing has been proposed by the Society for Vascular Surgery. This was the guidelines that was published in 2011, and we're just in the process of doing a new set of guidelines for TVAR, and it's going to be the same recommendations for traumatic aortic injury. That should be coming out in the next uh, six months, hopefully. So um, this, this comes from the SVS document. They suggest that endovascular repair be performed over open surgical repair for all patients. This was even before there was a uh, FDA approved TVAR device for trauma. So it just shows you how uh, you know, uh, strong the evidence is. Um, this is a patient with a grade one. As you can see, there's a tiny little intimal tear with an intramural thrombus. You can see that. Um, let me see, is there a, there you go. You guys can see this is um, the aortic contour is still normal. There's a little contrast defect right here. That's the intimal tear with the associated hematoma. You can see the same thing on IVIS. That was the subclavian artery. And as you go down, you can see that um, maybe this is the subclavian. It's coming down the arch, so that was innominate left carotid, and this must be the subclavian. And then there should be a tear uh, coming up. Uh, intimal tear, you can see, uh, should be probably around 2 o'clock on this image. You see that right there? Maybe it's around 12 o'clock or 11 to 12 o'clock. Everybody see that? That's the, um, this is the associated, intimal tear with the associated thrombus. That's a grade one. So what do you do with this? What do you do? What's your name? You. <laughs> what, what would you do? You always point to the guy behind you. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name, Joey? <laughs> Say it again. Blood pressure control. That's exactly right. So anti-impulse therapy. And when would you repeat the CAT scan? Answer for that. That's perfect. Good. So you repeat the casting in six weeks, and I promise you all of them are going to be gone. Okay, so grade one, medical therapy. This is another patient. You don't do medical therapy for these people. You see that left hemothorax. So this guy most likely has an aortic injury or lung injury, so you send him to the scanner, and this is what you see. What do you do for this guy? Do you wait till the morning or... Yeah, grade four injuries go to the OR emergently, okay? The other ones, you know, grade two, grade three, if they're stable, you can do blood pressure control. And, you know, if it's 3 a.m., you can wait till 7 a.m. But this guy needs to go to the OR emergently. So you take this guy to the operating room and you do a T-bar on them. You see that? That's, uh, that's just a disaster waiting to happen. So uh, we had to embolize this subclavian and cover all the way to the left carotid, and you can see that. So this is our experience. Um, we started distal aortic perfusion in 1999 for uh, our open repairs. When was the first TVAR approved? That's right, 2005. So we, we didn't have TVAR until 2005. There were some people doing endovascular repair using these aortic cuffs, but the problem is the treatment length of those aortic cuffs is only 56 centimeters, so you couldn't reach it into the thoracic aorta for all of them. So the first TVAR wasn't approved till, if, approved till 2005, and then this is our series, 331 patients. We just looked at this. Um, 
12% survived without an operation. Those are usually grade ones. 32% died on admission. It shows you that this is a very bad uh, diagnosis to deal with. Uh, we had 185 repairs. That's 56% of the patients. Uh, the mean age is about 38, 70% male. Mean injury severity score, score is 40. This is the mechanism of injury. As you can see, the majority have motor vehicle collisions, uh, motorcycles, pedestrians. And there was one guy actually who uh, was a parachute that didn't open, but he survived. So uh, the, this is the breakdown. 7% uh, had uh, open cross clamp and go. 3% had cardiopulmonary bypass for arch repair. 32% had distal aortic perfusion. All that is primarily before the era of T-bar. And 56% had T-bar. This is the... Um, uh, mortality, as you can see, uh, the cross clamp and go 15.4%, dysaurotic perfusion, open repair 5.1%, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, that means that the patient has an arch injury or an ascending injury, so these are very severely injured patients. The mortality was 66%, and the mortality for TVAR was 4.9%. So this is our operated mortality over the course of the study. As you can see, as we instituted these different treatment approaches, specifically T-bar, the mortality went down. So there was a 2% reduction per year over the course of this study in mortality related to traumatic heuridic injury. And these patients survive. You know, the survival is around 87%, and it's the same for open versus T-bar. Uh, these patients usually have relatively normal aortas. There is no risk of, you know, I haven't seen one of these devices migrate. Endo leak is very rare. So if you do a T-bar for a patient who has traumatic aortic injury, it's usually pretty, uh, you know, uh, durable repair. So what have we learned over the past, you know, uh, 15 years? Uh, that classification has prognostic significance. You know, uh, medical therapy is recommended for grade one. And TVAR is the standard of care for all anatomically suitable patients with traumatic aortic injury. A couple of other words about this um, nonprofit that we formed. It's called the Aortic Trauma Foundation. Uh, the mission is to improve outcomes of patients with traumatic aortic injury through education and research, and it's a nonprofit. There's a multi specialty medical advisory board, and there's a board of directors. And uh, this is our website, it's called aortictrauma.org. And our first uh, you know, um, project was doing this retrospective multi center study of nine American College of Surgeons level one trauma centers over the past, uh, over 2008 to 2013, uh, 453 patients. So this is the largest series ever published in the literature on traumatic aortic injury. And uh, this was uh, presented and published in the Journal of Trauma. This is the breakdown, as you can see, uh, grade three is the most common, 50% are grade three, uh, grade two is 18%, and grade one, still a quarter of the patients had grade one injury, so it's not uncommon. I, I forgot to mention, there's one indication where you would do a T-VAR on a grade one. What would that be? Does anybody know? Anybody want to guess? Someone you cannot do medical therapy for. Who would that be? Yeah, exactly. Head injury. If somebody has head injury and you can't put them on anti-impulse, then you would repair the traumatic aortic injury and then put them, increase their blood pressure, okay? So that's the one indication. So this is the T-bar versus open repair. Uh, lower overall mortality, it was 8.6 versus 20%. And lower aortic related mortality was 2.5% versus 13%. So this is the largest series published in the literature. And these are the independent predictors of all cause and aortic related mortality for traumatic aortic injury. If you look at all cause mortality, the independent predictors are the injury severity score, Non-operative management is protective. SVS uh, grade uh, is a risk factor. Uh, Glasgow Coma Score and uh, uh, you know transfusions. If you look at aortic related mortality, again injury severity score, the SVS grade, uh, TVAR is protective, and uh, the um, injury score for the chest. So that's, uh, in summary, everything you need to know about TVAR for your test and for your life. Thank you.